You use mesh utility bags as multi-purpose containers for bulky stuff that's hard to hang on to underwater. You'll use them for tasks like underwater cleanups or project-aware dive-against debris activities or carrying small loose items on a dive. They're also useful for carrying wet items after diving, like exposure suits. See your local dive center for choices best suited to what you have in mind. An important point, hand carry a loaded mesh utility bag while diving so you can let go of it if it tangles or weighs you down. You use a slate or wet book for communication, writing down dive information and so on. You can choose from different sized slates. Pick one you can pocket easily. Wet books use waterproof paper and offer more room for writing. Most are about this size, and because they flex, fit comfortably in exposure suit thigh pockets. When you night dive in the advanced open water diver course, you obviously need a dive light, but many divers find one useful during the day. Larger lights are more powerful and have longer burn times, though technology advances have made even the larger lights more compact. Ask your dive professional for assistance in choosing different battery, power, and size options. After choosing a light, you'll want a clip so you can attach it to your BCD and a wrist lanyard so you don't lose it in use. You will start your dive log as part of your training. Many divers like the time-proven Paddy dive log, but there are many other sizes and styles of dive logs to choose from. Also, you can go with an online tablet or PC e-log. Many dive computers download to programs like these, making logging convenient. Your dive log provides an experience record you'll use for continuing your education, and it's a good place to record emergency information, dive buddy phone numbers and email addresses equipment serial numbers, and so on. For each dive, you want to record the date, dive site, depth, duration, buddy name or names, and usually your objective, and some notes or a description of anything significant that happened. Your log also provides a resource for sharing information with others at Scuba Earth and on other online sites. Dive planning software helps you plan your air use and determine your allowable dive times. The most popular versions operate in your smartphone or tablet, though you can get personal computer programs. Some versions interface with your dive computer and also include e-log functions. Since a missing o-ring or torn strap can make you miss a dive, most divers have a spare parts kit. It's simply a collection of user-replaceable items and tools like these in a sturdy box you keep in your gear bag. In setting up your spare parts kit, start with these basics, but choose a box somewhat larger than you need. As you gain experience, you'll add to the kit, so leave some space for these, but don't overload it with things you don't actually use. You dive relaxed, but like any sport, diving can be physically strenuous, such as when walking in your gear, swimming in a current, or when responding to an emergency. So, stay reasonably fit with a regular exercise program approved by your physician. Eat well, get adequate rest, and keep immunizations current. It's also a good idea to have a physical examination regularly. Like any physical activity, Diver stresses put demands on your heart and cardiovascular system. This can happen lifting and carrying gear due to heat stress from wearing exposure suits in the sun and so on. These factors can cause heart attacks in predisposed individuals and they can be issues for other cardiovascular conditions. If you have or may have increased cardiovascular risk, be sure to discuss it with your physician. Never use alcohol or tobacco prior to diving. If you drink, use moderation the night before diving.
Some drugs can create problems while diving, so be cautious and consult your physician if you're unsure whether you can use a particular drug. You want to be in good physical health when diving. If you feel ill, cancel the dive. Dive again when you're well, and as you've already learned, don't use medications to eliminate symptoms and dive while you're sick. Diving is supposed to be fun, and you enjoy it by diving when healthy. Like in any activity, you keep your dive skills and knowledge sharp by using them and by diving regularly. If you can't get to open water, practice in a pool with a buddy. Staying up to date includes interacting with other divers and online communities like Scuba Earth because it helps you keep up with current trends and practices. If you go more than six months without diving, see your PADI instructor about refreshing your knowledge and skills in the Scuba Review program. Continuing your diver education is a great way to stay sharp because you use existing skills while developing new ones. You can do this in the PADI Advanced Open Water Diver Course, Specialty Diver Courses, and other programs that expand your experience and qualifications. Most recreational diving uses air as a breathing gas. Air is actually a mix of gases. Practically speaking, it is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. We'll look at four issues that relate to breathing air underwater. Oxygen toxicity, contaminated air, decompression sickness, and gas narcosis. We'll look at oxygen toxicity, contaminated air, and decompression sickness in this section, and gas narcosis later in section five. Although we need oxygen to live, under pressure, oxygen becomes toxic. It also has fire and combustion issues with equipment. When using air within recreational depth limits, though, neither of these are significant issues. Enriched air nitrox, however, is air enriched with oxygen, so it has a lower nitrogen proportion and a higher oxygen proportion. This has advantages compared to using regular air, but oxygen toxicity and equipment concerns can be issues with enriched air nitrox. You can learn to handle these issues in the PADI Enriched Air Diver course. But until you're certified as an enriched air diver, don't use a cylinder labeled as an enriched air cylinder. Contaminated air is air with impurities in it. It's very rare in diving. Contaminated air may smell or taste bad, but not necessarily. Signs and symptoms of contaminated air include headache, nausea, dizziness, unresponsiveness, and cherry red lips or nail beds. Never dive with air that smells or tastes bad, and end the dive immediately if you start feeling ill. Have a diver who may have breathed contaminated air breathe fresh air and provide oxygen if available. Contact emergency medical care. Avoid contaminated air by getting your cylinder filled only by reputable professional scuba centers. These operators use specialized breathing air compressors and filters and know the value of regular air testing. You've learned that you have time limits underwater beyond how long your air lasts or how long you stay warm. One of these comes from nitrogen. During a dive, Increased pressure causes nitrogen to dissolve from your air into your body tissues. The greater the pressure, that is the deeper you are, and the longer you're down, the more nitrogen dissolves into your body. Your body doesn't use nitrogen, so when you ascend and the pressure drops, this excess nitrogen dissolves back out of your body tissues. If the extra nitrogen isn't excessive, this happens harmlessly. Your dive computer, or tables like the RDP table, or ERDPML, helps you keep excess nitrogen within accepted limits. More about this shortly. If there's too much dissolved nitrogen, however, when you ascend, it may come out of solution faster than your body can eliminate it. Bubbles can form in body tissues, causing decompression sickness, which is a serious medical condition, sometimes called the BENS, or DCS. 
Signs and symptoms include paralysis, shock, weakness and prolonged fatigue, dizziness, numbness, tingling, difficulty breathing, limb and joint pain, and in severe cases, unconsciousness and death. DCS signs and symptoms may be obvious, but they can also be subtle. Like a mild to moderate ache, weakness, or prolonged undue fatigue, they occur within 15 minutes to 12 hours after a dive, though some longer intervals have occurred. Symptoms may be intermittent. Regardless, treat all suspected cases of decompression sickness as serious. We'll look at the first aid for it in Section 5. Time and depth primarily influence how your body absorbs and releases nitrogen, but physiologists think some other factors predispose people to DCS. These include fatigue, dehydration, vigorous exercise, cold, poor fitness, illness and injuries, alcohol consumption, and age. In the next subsection, you'll learn how to help adjust for these if any of them apply to you. To keep the risk of decompression sickness very low, we need to keep excess nitrogen levels within accepted limits. But there's no way to measure the actual nitrogen dissolving into our bodies. So we use dive computers and dive tables. Dive computers and dive tables apply a mathematical model to estimate the changes in body nitrogen before, during, and after a dive. Based on the outcomes of thousands of dives, decompression models are highly reliable for the vast majority of people, most of the time. But they don't assess anything actually going on in your body, and they don't know if any predisposing factors apply to you. Because people vary in their susceptibility to decompression sickness, no dive computer or dive table can guarantee that decompression sickness will never occur, even though you dive within its limits. As a diver, you must accept that some risk of DCS remains. To help reduce and manage the remaining risk, the key is to always dive well within dive computer or table limits. And be a safe diver. Slowly ascend from every dive no faster than 18 meters or 60 feet per minute, or slower as specified by your computer. Make a safety stop at 5 meters or 15 feet. All of these practices help keep you well within the model's predications. As a recreational diver, you always make no-stop dives. This means that at any time during a dive, you could ascend directly to the surface if you had to. To do this, you stay within your computer's no-stop limits, which you can access before the dive for planning. The deeper you dive, the faster you absorb nitrogen. So as you can see, the no-stop limits get significantly shorter as depth increases. Times differ slightly with different models, but these are typical. During the dive, your computer updates your no-stop time based on the time you spend at each depth. Your remaining time will be shortest at your deepest point, but it increases as you ascend because nitrogen absorption slows. Diving so you get more time by ascending to a shallower depth is called multi-level diving. This is one of the big advantages of dive computers. Tables base your time limit on your deepest depth, even if you don't stay that deep the whole dive, which is often not the case. Note that the exception to this is the ERDP ML, which lets you plan multi-level dives. Let's look at how your limits might change during a typical dive. These divers want to dive to 18 meters or 60 feet, explore a bit, then gradually work their way upward so they stay well within no-stop limits and have 50 bar or 500 PSI air left when they surface. During pre-dive planning, they scroll their no-stop times. Their computers show 140 minutes no-stop time at 12 meters or 40 feet and 55 minutes at 18 meters or 60 feet. 
they decide they will descend to 18 meters, or 60 feet, then start back up at 30 minutes. The dive goes as planned. After half an hour at 18 meters, or 60 feet, their computers show 25 minutes no stop time remaining. They head upward along the reef and level off at 12 meters, or 40 feet. Their computers show 83 minutes no stop time. This is a lot more time than they had at 18 meters or 60 feet, but their bodies have absorbed nitrogen, so it's less than the 140 minutes they had before diving. However, it's more no stop time than they have air, so they end the dive with enough air to ascend, make a safety stop, and surface with a 50 bar or 500 PSI reserve. Dive computers and tables ascent rates are part of their calculations, so stay within these rates. Safety stops are not required for surfacing within model limits, but you make them for added conservatism well within limits. In an emergency, like an out-of-air situation, you would omit the stop, but otherwise make it. If you accidentally exceed a no-stop limit, on the other hand, you must make a decompression stop. In this case, you need the stop to release excess nitrogen before surfacing. Without the stop, you would exceed model limits and have an unacceptable decompression sickness risk. You'll learn more about emergency decompression stops in Section 5. After a dive, your no-stop times are shorter than before the dive. This is because your body still has excess nitrogen from the previous dive. We call the nitrogen from a previous dive residual nitrogen and a dive made while you still have residual nitrogen, a repetitive dive. When you make a repetitive dive, your no-stop limits are shorter because you already have nitrogen in your body. Your computer must account for this residual nitrogen as well as what dissolves into your body on the repetitive dive. You have to wait several hours without diving, usually 12 or more, before body nitrogen levels return to normal. After that, a dive isn't considered a repetitive dive. Although you still have nitrogen in your body after a dive, during a surface interval between dives, the nitrogen levels decline. As a result, the longer the surface interval, the more no-stop time you have on a repetitive dive. Your computer calculates your theoretical nitrogen levels continuously, so it is important that you use the same computer for all dives throughout the day. It remembers your residual nitrogen, so don't share or trade computers, and don't turn it off. Most models won't let you anyway. If you don't dive with the same computer continuously, it can't accurately calculate theoretical nitrogen. Diving without using the same computer for all dives greatly increases your risk of decompression sickness. And follow any additional manufacturer recommendations regarding the use of a computer for repetitive diving. Before using your dive computer, read the manufacturer literature completely. Dive computers vary in their features and layout, but as a minimum, virtually all tell you your no-stop limits before a dive. While underwater, you can read your depth, elapsed time, and your no-stop time remaining. An ascent rate indicator guides your ascent speed, and emergency decompression information comes up if you accidentally exceed a no-stop limit. Between dives, you can read your surface interval time and recall previous dive information. When you're ready to plan your dive, you activate it by pressing a button or touching contacts like this. With your buddy, agree on a maximum depth and time based on the scrolled no-stop limits. Remember that repetitive dives have shorter no-stop limits, and that shallower dives and multi-level dives have longer ones. Plan a maximum time and your air use limits. You often have far more no-stop time than your air will last. You turn the dive based on whichever limit you or your buddy reaches first. Time air supply turn point, or remaining no-stop time. You may want to note these on a slate to reference during the dive. 
There are six guidelines to follow while diving with your computer. One, dive the plan. Don't go deeper or stay longer than planned just because your computer will let you. Two, stay well within computer limits. Never let your remaining no stop time get close to zero. Three, follow the most conservative computer, yours or your buddies. Four, watch your SPG and manage your air supply. Five, when you can, start at the deepest point and progress shallower. When making more than one dive, make the deepest dive first. This gives the most no stop time and is considered a conservative diving practice. And six, ascend slowly within your computer's ascent rate and make a safety stop. Dive computer failure is very rare. Most self-check and confirm adequate battery power when activated. If one fails during a dive, however, you have two options. The first is to ascend, make a safety stop, and end the dive. By diving well within limits, you should be within acceptable theoretical nitrogen limits. If you have two computers and have been diving with both of them, your second option is to continue the dive with the working computer. If your computer fails between dives and you've been diving with two, you can make another dive using the one that works. If you've been diving with one computer and it fails, you may be able to continue diving by using your time and depth information with dive tables, a depth gauge, and timer. Otherwise, you need to wait 12 hours before diving again with a working computer. Divers are not a significant threat to the underwater world, but it's important that we apply environmentally friendly dive techniques. Diver damage is inconsiderate. Other divers want to see the natural beauty and cultural heritage you see. It can also add to the problems where pollution already stresses the environment. More importantly, as a diver, you have a role as the underwater world's ambassador, and how you dive sets an example. Divers see the underwater world firsthand and are often the first witnesses to problems. How you dive is part of your credibility when you explain what you see and add your voice to initiatives that inform the public and protect the underwater world. You can also take direct actions, such as participating in cleanups, removing invasive species, or collecting data for scientists. To learn more about how you can apply your role as a diver to preserving the underwater world, see your paddy resort or dive center and visit projectaware.org. A skill you'll learn is how to put on your scuba kit at the surface. This is a common part of small boat entries but you may do this from almost any size vessel, from docks and other situations. With your equipment fully assembled, go through your pre-dive safety check, even though you're not wearing it. Make sure it will float. You may need to put your weights in after you get into it. If you're not using a weight integrated BCD, you'll put your weights on after you have your dive kit on. Don't enter the water without a BCD while wearing your scuba weight system. When ready, put your gear in the water, on a line if you won't get in right away, or your buddy can hand it to you after you enter. Enter using a suitable technique, like the controlled seated entry. For this entry, sit like this and put both hands on the deck, like this. Pivot onto your hands and lower yourself in, like this. Now, unbuckle the waistband, hold your kit upright and slip into it. It may help to have just enough air in the BCD so it barely floats.
Another technique is to sit on your rig, like this. Stick your arms in and then slip forward so it rides up into place. After it's on, secure and adjust the harness. Then put on your weight system if it was too heavy to put on before. Once your buddy's in his kit, finish the F-step. Final check of the pre-dive safety check to be sure all straps are secure and that you didn't accidentally trap any hoses. You can also use the controlled seated entry while wearing scuba. Partially inflate your BCD and breathe from your regulator as you would on any entry. Be sure the bottom of your cylinder has cleared the platform edge before you lower yourself into the water. You may have to help a buddy who's tired or who has a cramp or other problem that makes swimming difficult. First, be sure you're both buoyant. Use the cylinder valve toe for short distance toes, like this. For longer distances, the tired diver push lets you see where you're going. Put the diver's feet on your shoulders and your hands on his knees, like this and swim at a slow, steady pace. This skill combines your neutral buoyancy skill with descending, swimming and ascending just as you will in open water. You'll pretend that the bottom, or an area, is fragile, like coral, and avoid contact with it. When ready, make a five-point descent with your buddy using a line or other references as a visual reference only. Control your descent by controlling your buoyancy so that you stop and achieve neutral buoyancy about 1 to 1.2 meters or 3 to 4 feet above the bottom. Then, control your buoyancy and swim without touching the bottom. Control your movements, not just your buoyancy. Learn to only make contact with something when you intend to. Return to the reference line and make a five-point ascent using it as a visual reference only, again without touching the bottom. If you lost your mask and couldn't recover it, you'd have to end the dive without it. The no mask swim lets you practice this. Remove your mask and make buddy contact. Keep your eyes open if you can, but close them if you're wearing contacts. Swim at least 15 meters or 50 feet, equalizing your ears and controlling your buoyancy with your buddy assisting. Concentrate on breathing through your mouth. If you get a little water in your nose, exhale through it. After completing the swim, replace and clear your mask. In Section 3, you learn that you can breathe from a free-flowing regulator. To simulate a free flow, you or your instructor will depress the purge button. Remember to hold the mouthpiece against your lips, like this. Don't seal your mouth on it, but you can insert one side if it helps. Let the excess air escape as you sip the air you need from the flow. After practicing, check your SPG. You may be surprised at how much air you used. This shows that it's important to start your ascent promptly when breathing from a free-flowing regulator. If you have to disconnect your low-pressure inflator, you can orally inflate your BCD underwater to control your buoyancy. Hold the inflator or deflator in your left hand like this. Take a breath from your regulator, then blow a third to half your breath into your BCD, like this, and save enough to clear your regulator. Go back to your regulator, then repeat the process if you need more buoyancy. Don't forget, blow bubbles when the regulator's out of your mouth. After establishing neutral buoyancy, hover for 60 seconds using breath control and making small adjustments as needed. Skin diving, breath hold diving without scuba, lets you scout an area or explore shallow water without wasting scuba air. 
You can also skin dive where scuba diving isn't available. Proper breathing helps you hold your breath longer. Relax and breathe from your diaphragm. The practice of hyperventilation, breathing deeply and or rapidly before holding your breath, was once common, but is no longer preferred because if not done properly, it may cause you to lose consciousness underwater, which can cause drowning. Relaxed diaphragm breathing will help you hold your breath longer. When you return to the surface after a breath hold dive, breathe normally from your diaphragm. A strong exhalation after surfacing from a long breath hold can cause you to become faint. Relax for several minutes while your body oxygen and carbon dioxide levels return to normal. If you feel dizzy or lightheaded, or feel tingling in your hands, arms, or feet, stop diving down. Rest. Relax and breathe at the surface until you fully recover. Use a headfirst surface dive, sometimes called a duck dive, to get underwater quickly. Swim forward breathing relaxed from your diaphragm, then hold a breath and bend forward like this. See how you lift your legs as straight and high as you can? Their weight pushes you down efficiently. Swim downward, equalizing as you've already learned. Relax and explore. With practice, you may be surprised how long you can stay on one breath. Notice that your buddy stays up while you're down. Take turns, one up, one down. That way, if someone needs help, the buddy comes down to assist with a fresh breath. When you feel the urge to breathe, look up, reach up, and turn so you can see as you come up. While looking up, exhale as you go through the last meter or few feet of water. Keep exhaling as you roll forward to a swimming position, and your snorkel should be nearly clear of water. If not, use the blast method you learned earlier. Some divers prefer the blast method in any case. Sometimes you take your kit off in the water to exit. Inflate your BCD, then remove and hand up your weights. Switch to your snorkel, then release your harness and slip out of your rig. It may help to only inflate the BCD enough for your rig to float. Keep all your other gear in place. Then hand up your kit or tie it to a line. If you're exiting without a ladder, like onto a small boat or low dock, push up with your arms and kick to raise yourself. Twist into a seated position like this. Or lower yourself onto your chest and roll over like this. Once out, lift your kit from the water. 